Um, life is tragic, and history doesn't care if we make bad decisions. And by, by life is tragic, I mean not that it has an unhappy ending or that bad things happen. I mean that it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the consciousness of that uh, resounds through our lives. Um, as a society, we're having a hard time constructing a coherent narrative about what's happening to us and what we're going to do about it. Now, I've written a few books about it, and I want to talk to you about it. Um, right now, there are, we're, there's a horse race going on between three things that can put us out of business. One of them is uh, climate change, which is going to probably express itself soonest in food shortages and problems with food. That's the first way you'll see it. The other one, of course, is the peak oil situation, which is really the general uh, global energy predicament. Uh, and the other one is the banking fiasco, which is actually in a position now to win the race, to put us out of business, because it's so deep and comprehensive, and most of us don't really know what it's about. Uh, we got rid of our manufacturing capacity in the last 30 years and uh, gave it away to other people. And what we used to do was make things of value, produce things of value, and to compensate for the fact that we don't do that anymore, we created uh, a, we, we blew up the financial system into a giant monster and created a new kind of creative financial instrument or security. Um, and it was based on, not on the idea of producing things of value, because you know securities basically represent the hope and expectation that we will have more stuff in the future than we had in the past. And that's why things like stocks and bonds have value. But when we got rid of our ability to actually make things of value and have more stuff in the future than we did in the past, we decided that it would be better to try to get something for nothing. And so the two characteristics of these new uh, Frankenstein securities that were created are the parts that have only been discussed very, very recently. Really only in the last few weeks has the words percolated into the press. That is, swindles and frauds. And that's what we did to ourselves. And now the, uh, the financial system, the banks in particular, are choking on bad paper, bad, bad uh, investments, money that will never be paid back. And um, the trouble with this uh, is that it represents the disappearance of capital. And by capital, by the way, I don't mean capitalism, because it's, this is not an ideology. It doesn't matter what your political stance is. You know, compound interest worked for communists just as well as it works for capitalists, for, for Westerners. Um, but it, it, it's about um, uh, the operations of money and the acquisition of surplus wealth and accumulation of surplus wealth and how you deploy it for productive purposes. And the trouble is that we're, we have, uh, we're in the process of losing our capital. So all the money that we hoped would be there to build a post-industrial, post-oil economy, whatever it was going to be, that money is now leaving the solar system and getting sucked into a black hole from which it will never emerge and we'll never see it again. And we're going to be a much more uh, austere and less affluent society than we have been. And we don't know that yet. We don't really quite understand it. One of the uh, ways this will be expressed is the revolving debt economy is over. From now on, if you run a business or a household or government, uh, you're going to have to uh, do it on uh, uh, revenue that's coming in. You're not going to be able to just charge your stuff on credit cards. Uh, that's over. I want to talk about the energy situation a little bit. Um, one of the lessons of the Macondo blowout in the Gulf of Mexico was that we wouldn't be doing that there in the, those difficult and expensive and dangerous circumstances if there was a lot of cheap, easy oil to get. The fact of the matter is, there isn't. And, uh, you know, I get letters from nutty people every week. And one of the, because this is becoming an increasingly delusional society, in fact, you can state categorically, the more economic distress is felt, the more crazy, the more delusional our behavior gets. So um, I have a special folder I keep for ideas like this called complete fucking nonsense. And this is the idea that the earth is a bonbon with a creamy nougat center of oil. It's not true. We are, we're really in trouble with oil, and I'm not going to go through the many ways that we're in trouble. You can read up, you can Google peak oil on the internet and you can find out about it. So I bundled these uh, 
uh, problems into a, a, you know, sort of a, a comprehensive worldview. Uh, I wrote a book about it called The Lung Emergency, published in 2005. And um, uh, the question really is, you know, what are we going to do about this? You know, because th these, these problems have the capability of really thrusting us uh, into a, a kind of a dark age. So what are we going to do about it? Well, one thing is, um, at every college lecture I give, some person gets up and says, you didn't say anything about population. I just want to make it clear, it's a terrible problem. We've overshot the world's carrying capacity, but we're not going to do a darn thing about it, okay? There's not going to be any protocol. There's not going to be any policy. You know, forget it. So let's not even bother yammering about that. There's understandably a wish to keep all of our stuff going because we've, we've acquired all of our stuff. But the important thing to understand is we're not going to run Walt Disney World, the interstate highway system, the U.S. Army, suburbia, uh, and Walt Disney World, did I say that already, Walmart. We're not going to run all that stuff on any combination of alternative fuels. And the thing that you've got to understand, and maybe the biggest takeaway from this meeting, from this presentation is, we're going to be disappointed about what these things can do for us. We're going to be disappointed about this, and we got to make other arrangements for daily life, and we don't get it because we think that we're going to run all our shit on solar, wind, uh, use French fried potato oil, dark matter, nuclear, thorium, uh, biomass, biodiesel, and we're not going to run us even a substantial fraction of our stuff on that. But I don't want to be misunderstood. We are, I'm not against, I'm not inveighing against alternative energy. Um, uh, all, all I'm saying is it's going to be on a much smaller scale than we realize. It's going to be much more modest, maybe at the household level, the district and, and town level. But we're not going to be building uh, dozens and scores and scores of uh, wind farms with Godzilla-sized turbines. You, know, you can just forget about it. We don't have a capital. In some cases, we don't have the, even the materials to fabricate the hardware to do it. One of the reigning delusions uh, of the day is that technology and energy are the same, and if you run out of one, you plug in the other. It's simply an idea that doesn't comport with reality, and we're going to find out the hard way. Case in point, you know, we're either going to run these things on the things they were designed to run on, or we're not going to have a commercial aviation industry, and the likelihood is within five years or so, we're not going to have a commercial aviation industry. And by the way, one of the great tragedies of our time is that uh, the, in the 2008 presidential campaign, uh, the issue of rebuilding the American passenger railroad system was not an issue. And all that shows really is how unserious we are as a people. We're completely unserious. We have no idea what is happening to us and no idea what's going to happen to us. And the whole peak oil story is not about running out of oil. It's really about something totally different. It's about the complex systems that we depend on for everyday life and what's going to happen to them. And what will happen to them is they will become unstable, they will wobble, they will reinforce each other's instabilities and weaknesses, and they, uh, they will possibly collapse because of that. And you can, you, you know, th this isn't a metaphysical or abstract thing. You can state what these things are with precision, the complex systems that we depend on. The way we do farming, we produce our food, namely industrial agriculture. And by the way, one of the other huge inputs besides the petroleum and natural gas-based uh, fertilizers and herbicides, is capital. Because it could, you have to borrow a lot of money to run a big industrial farm, and we are running out of capital. And we don't even realize how bad that situation is. Another system that we depend on, the way we do commerce in America, which for the last 30 years is big box shopping, okay, we're done. We don't know that yet. But it's over for that. The 12,000-mile supply lines for the merchandise, for the plastic salad shooters and all that stuff, that's not going to go on for very much longer. We're already beginning to have a trade war expressed as a currency argument with our main supplier, China. That's going to get more intense. So, big problem. The way we do transportation in America, which it comes in two forms, happy motoring, commercial aviation mainly. Okay? Uh, we're done with happy motoring, and the American public has no idea how close to the horizon of that we are. You know, because everything has seemed normal up until now. You can still get gasoline. When it does, when we hit the horizon, it's probably going to be a rather sudden horizon. And finally, the way we inhabit the landscape, which for the last 50 years in the USA has been suburban sprawl, you know, expressed this way. And by the way, these people are not having a better day because of the water tower. 
No one's, you know, no one's happier down there on the street. And you can describe this with some precision too. You know, uh, I've had many ways of, of uh, discussing it, but lately the way I, I describe it is the greatest misallocation of resources in the history of the world. And you can state that because it is a living arrangement with no future. We're not going to be able to run it. To make matters worse, along with inflating the financial system to become something like 40% of our economy, over the last 30, 40 years, you know, we deluded ourselves into thinking we had a new economy, and we gave it various names. We called it the service economy. We called it the post-industrial economy, the digital economy. And that was all bullshit, too. What it really was, was the suburban sprawl building economy, okay? Especially in the, in the Sun Belt. And that's the reason that their economies are failing uh, worse than anybody else's, okay? In Florida, Arizona, New, uh, Nevada, California. Because what this activity was, was an economy based on building more stuff with no future. Life is tragic. So, you know, we got we to gotta do something, and we got to figure out some things to do and get serious. And I think the key to understanding where we're going, what we're going to do, is that we got to downscale everything, we got to relocalize everything. <clears throat> the idea propagated by Tom Friedman at the New York Times that the earth is flat is an erroneous idea. It is not a permanent installation of the human condition, uh, the global economy. Okay? The global economy was a special uh, set of transient economic relations based on special circumstances in a special time in history. Namely, uh, about a century of really cheap energy and about a half a century of the, uh, relative peace between large, uh, between the great powers. Okay, and that's why you had globalism. The world is now going to get bigger and rounder. So prepare for it. You're going to live on a more localized patch of it. Um, as I go around the country, do college lectures and stuff, there's a great clamor for solutions. Give us solutions, they all say. Give us solutions. Don't be Mr. Gloom and Doom. That glass is not half empty. You know, we want solutions. And what I've begun to realize is when that's code, that's code, even coming from the well-intentioned people, that's code. Because what they're really saying is give us a way to keep on living exactly the way we're living without changing. You know? That's what it really means. And I saw this you know, firsthand at the, the Aspen Environmental Forum, where I went for two years in a row. And every time the subject of automobile dependency or our predicament with oil came up, this was the cream of the cream of the environmental movement. The only thing they wanted to talk about was all the great new ways you can run cars on something besides gasoline. They didn't want to talk about walkable communities. They don't want to talk about public transit. They don't want to talk about restoring the American railroad system. And if they can't have an, a coherent, intelligent conversation, who are you going to depend on? The people who voted for, uh, for Jim DeMint in South Carolina? Because they're not going to generate an intelligent conversation. So what I, you know, what, what, what I really urge people to do is not yammer about solutions and start ta instead talking about intelligent responses to the problems that we have. And by the way, you know, I mentioned this to somebody uh, in the audience uh, a while ago. One of the biggest problems that we're having right now in the United States is a, a mental disease of techno-grandiosity, techno-triumphalism. We're so infatuated with our technological uh, achievements because we've created little devices that glow, that you can touch, and things happen. Okay, so now we've deluded ourselves into thinking we're going to solve this set of solve this set of problems and keep on living exactly the way we're living because we can do that. And this is, believe me, this is a, a mental illness. It's it's related to another one that's that I've noticed lately. It's really bugging me. I call it statistical uh, analysis grandiosity, and it's the idea. You know, we're bombarded with studies and statistical analysis, and what I realize is that. Um, we think that just because we can uh, measure stuff, we can control it. Okay, we got to make uh, other arrangements. So, you know, one of the obvious solutions, one of the obvious responses to the problems of automobile dependency and not having enough oil to run suburbia is to live in walkable communities again and to do everything we can to make every policy possible to encourage that to happen. And, uh, you know, we're not interested. We're not talking about it. 
we're going to have to grow our food differently, closer to home, probably requiring more human attention, uh, probably uh, uh, requiring much smaller scales of operation. Uh, we've barely begun to think about that in the United States. And the places that do not exist in proximity to good agricultural land are going to be in real trouble. We're going to see a lot of demographic shifts. But, you know, the idea that if suburbia fails, everybody will move to the city, that's an erroneous idea. Because most of our big cities, our metroplexes, are not scaled to the energy realities of the future. And they're going to fail, too, in a different way. For example, the places that are overburdened with skyscrapers, sky skyscrapers are a building type that have no future. And we don't know that yet. We're still building them. We're still putting up 30-story towers. We, in fact, we, a guy in the New Yorker wrote an, an article that said the greenest way to live is on a, in a giant skyscraper in the city. And we're going to discover. And the reason, by the way, that the skyscrapers are going to fail is not just because of the energy problems. It's because of this. They will never be renovated. Okay? We're not going to have the capital. We're not going to have the synthetic modular fabricated materials to rebuild them. So we're done. The places that probably have a future are going to be the small places that are scaled to the energy realities of the future. Lots of them in the upper Mohawk and Hudson Valley, uh, Valley just waiting to be reactivated. We can't afford this anymore either, okay? Especially men. Men got to man up. Okay, stop dressing like babies and clans. And I want, want you to notice something. You know, the reason that, that uh, young men are wearing these clothes where, you know, the shorts come down to here and the shirt comes up to here is, and, the, and they have a sideways hat is because they don't feel like men. They feel like babies. So 20-year-old kids are dressing like 4-year-olds. And notice that there's no analog to this in female behavior. The, uh, the females are dressing like hypersexualized adults and the, the men are dressing like babies. So if we continue to do that, you know, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Hope. Hope. I'm sorry, I got to rush through it. This is usually a two and a half hour college lecture, so <laughs> I'm kind of rushing. But it's important to know, it's important for you to know that you are the generators of the hope. It's not going to be conferred upon you like pixie dust. You have to generate it in, inside yourself. And the way you're going to generate it is by discovering that you're a competent person, that you can understand the signals that reality is sending to you, and that you can respond intelligently. And when you do that, you will automatically understand that, uh, you, that you're capable of feeling hope. So we have a huge to-do list. We got a lot of things we got to do. Got to rebuild commerce, agriculture, transportation, the human habitat, and lots of other things. Medicine, education, because they're not going to work out the way we think either. And uh, we don't have time to be crybabies. We don't have time to wring our hands. You know, we just got to put our shoulders to the wheel and get it done.